On this episode of Real Truth, we take a look at the increased interest of Lent among evangelical Christians. Is this a beneficial observance to participate in? Or should it be avoided? Also, are we becoming too dependent on our technology? What does the Bible teach us about depending on technology? Let's consider the truth about all of that up next. I'm glad you joined us for another episode of Real Truth. If you haven't already, I would appreciate it if you could like this video, subscribe to the channel, and hit that bell icon to receive notifications. That will help YouTube suggest our videos to viewers like you. With that out of the way, let's start our first segment, Bible Truth. This is the segment that presents a short Bible teaching to encourage you in your walk with God. For this week's Bible Truth, I want to give a biblical response to Lent. According to Catholic Answers at Catholic.com, Lent is the 40 days before Easter in which Catholics pray, fast, contemplate, and engage in acts of spiritual self-discipline. It starts on Ash Wednesday, so technically it is 46 days, with a partial fast on that day and every Friday up to Easter. It is on these days that they also abstain from eating meat except fish, eggs, butter, and milk. It is also taught to abstain from something whether it is smoking, a certain food, television, or any other activity or bad habit with the aim of self-discipline. Now they say that the time frame is based on Jesus' 40 days in the desert, but many evangelical Christians dispute those claims. There are some variances with the practice of Lent across a few Protestant denominations in the Eastern Orthodox Church, but they are similar in purpose and symbolism. The Bible does not teach Lent. Instead, it is based on the authority of the Church and the tradition of man. They use this time to focus on repentance and remind them that Jesus died on a Friday. Because he gave up himself, they give up certain actions. Many people see Lent as a sacramental practice to earn more of God's blessing. Lent is preceded by Fat Tuesday, a day intended for overindulgence before fasting and abstinence. This is followed by Ash Wednesday, which is said to have roots in the Old Testament practice of using dust and ashes to represent repentance and warning. On this day, a priest rubs a cross of ash onto a person's forehead to show that they belong to Christ. Fasting, in and of itself, is a legitimate spiritual discipline taught in Scripture. Just look at Acts 14.23. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed unto the Lord in whom they had believed. There are many examples of fasting that we cannot cover today, but it is often paired with praying or regretting one's sin. In that passage we just read, they were praying in addition to fasting. Fasting is also useful to help you depend on God and recognize how He can sustain you. Jesus gave us some rules about how we should fast. Matthew 6, verses 16 through 18 says this, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. 
But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. That your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When we fast, there is a temptation to flaunt it before others to show that you're some super spiritual Christian or something like that. The hypocrites in this passage disfigured their faces while fasting so people would see it. But God wants us to fast in a way that's not seen by others, but only by God, which we've done in secret, basically. Instead, Catholics disfigure their faces with ash and make it don't known during Lent. Does that sound like they have washed their faces and done it in secret? It's almost like it is intended to be seen so one can receive a greater blessing from God. The Bible makes it clear that grace is a free gift that is not increased by certain actions. Daniel once abstained from meat, but that was to show that God sustained him instead of the lavish food that he was provided with. God did tell the Israelites to abstain from certain foods, but that was intended to separate them from the world. These are the only examples of abstinence. You see, God only cares about obedience, not sacrifice. After Saul thought he could sacrifice to the Lord in his own way, well, look what happened in 1 Samuel 15, 22. And Samuel said, As the Lord has great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. Just like Saul, Lent is man's method of sacrifice that might not necessarily please God. The only reason we are told to abstain from meat or certain activities is to prevent another Christian from stumbling. For example, if a Christian used to sacrifice meat to idols, it might make them uncomfortable if you then ate that meat. The purpose of this is to help the less mature Christian. Romans 14 tells us all about that. Scripture does not teach us to abstain from meat for the purpose of self-discipline. However, the Bible does teach that we should abstain from the desires of our flesh and the sin that we discover in our lives. But this should be a continual part of our lives not just during a specific season of the year. 1 Peter 2 verse 11 proclaims, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Colossians 3 5 also tells us, Put to death therefore what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. These verses make it clear that to follow Christ, one must give up sinful practices and fleshly desires. We should always try to follow these commands, not just during certain times of the year, to help us understand more about some of the negatives of Lent, I want to spend a few minutes Looking in depth at Colossians 2, verses 16 through 23. It starts at verse 16, Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. In these verses, the Colossians were dealing with false teachers you tried to restrict what someone could eat, drink, or observe. Expositor's Bible commentary makes this statement. In light of what Christ did, the Colossians were to let no one judge their standing 
before God on the basis of their observance or non-observance of the regulations of the Mosaic Law. So, these verses are teaching that in these situations, Christians have liberty, but that freedom might be limited to consider a weaker brother. These verses could also refer to asceticism and abstinence of food. Either way, Paul's point is that Christians are freed from obligations like these as they are unnecessary to prove one's salvation. Any former regulations were a shadow of what was fulfilled in Christ. Now that we have Christ, the former sacrifices and any other regulations we devise are not necessary. Now look at verse 18. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with the growth that is from God. Paul is saying here not to be led astray by those who insist on mysticism and self-abasement. They even taught the worship of angels in the details of their visions. Kind of sounds like modern day Mormons. These things do not add any value to the Christian life, and they could actually take away the blessings of truly following Christ. Those who insist on these things become puffed up with pride because they think these restrictions make them more holy. Apart from Christ, who is the head of the church, the body of Christ cannot experience true spiritual growth. Now look at verse 20. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? In Christ, we are united with him in his death and resurrection. As a result, we have died to the world. So then why do we try to unionize ourselves back to the world and its regulations? We're not alive to the world any longer, so it is of no benefit to tie ourselves to it through regulations. Verse 21 says, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Referring to the things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body. But they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. All of these restrictions, self-neglect, and self-infliction only have an appearance of wisdom. These practices are, well, empty, because they focus on temporal things that will only pass away. Asceticism does not have any eternal value, and it cannot control the sin in our lives. To wrap up these verses, I can't say it any better than John MacArthur in his commentary. While reasonable care and discipline of one's body is of temporal value, it is no eternal value and the extremes of asceticism serve only to gratify the flesh. All too often, ascetics seek only to put on the public show of their supposed holiness. The point of all of this is that Lent is a man-made ritual that has little if any true spiritual benefit. Christians have the freedom to choose to observe Lent as long as they don't boast about it or think they can earn more grace. However, while fasting can be beneficial, Lent is not commanded in Scripture, and several of these practices 
I know how God wants us to grow closer to Him. Repentance is certainly important in the Christian life, but we should always seek to become more like Him, not just during a prescribed season. With that, we come to our second segment for today, Real Tech. This is the segment where I relate the truth of the Bible to various technological advancements and how we use them. For today's Real Tech, I want to discuss our dependence on technology. It seems like every few months, one or more major online services go down. And that's when people flock to social media to share their issues, complaints, and dissatisfaction. Earlier this week, both Spotify and Discord experienced an outage. Those are very widely used platforms, so when they go down, you're probably going to hear about it. And the same is true whenever Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or any services like that go down. During this particular outage this week, it got me thinking about how dependent we have become on services such as these. Well, there is nothing wrong with benefiting from technology and even depending on it to some degree. When it leads to such negativity, it makes me wonder if we are too dependent on it at times. Whenever there is an outage like this, I always hear statements like, I don't know what I'm going to do until I get my Facebook back. Or, I can't get any work done without my tunes. Or, I'm so bored out of my mind right now because I can't scroll down my timeline. You may have even felt this way yourself when you have been without your services. This really extends to just about any technology as well. For those who have been without cable or satellite, it is always painful to be without television, especially if it's something you're used to. I think most people become annoyed when their internet goes down because they either can't get anything done or they have nothing to do without it. Or maybe your car breaks down. Maybe your electricity goes out. Whatever it is, there are many examples of technology that we depend on. From this, it is easy to see that we've grown very accustomed to our modern conveniences that when they are absent, we feel the effects of it and can have a really bad day as a result. The truth of the matter is, all these technologies we have grown so dependent on are luxuries anyway. Most of these advancements have only occurred in the past several hundred years. Many of these advancements are helpful, and it is okay to use them in our everyday lives. But it is also true that they can become so important to us that when we lose them, it greatly affects our mood. Many advancements are so ubiquitous that we cannot imagine life without them. Of course, the invention of many of these technologies have created countless jobs and have been beneficial to everyone, or at least those who live in areas that have access to them. I'm not saying that we can't use technology, People have been using technology since the beginning of creation to improve the quality of their lives. There's an example of this as far back as Genesis 4, verses 20 through 22. Adam bore Jabal, he was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal, he was the father of all those who played the lyre and pipe. Zilla also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Jubal Cain was Nela. 
In this passage, we have clear examples of those who invented things to help or improve their quality of life. We saw the inventor of tents, the inventor of musical instruments, and even one who invented metallurgy. So we see that creativity is a part of the human life. And that's kind of to be expected. God created us. If we are to be like him, we should also be creative. All of the technological advancements we use, whether it is running water, toilet paper, housing, electricity, the internet, modern medicine, etc. All of these are very beneficial to humans and they can even help us serve God. One problem with some of the ways we use technology is that it can become our idol. I talked about this in my video on AI, so feel free to go back and watch it if you're interested. Today, I want to ask the question, what if we depend on God like we depend on technology? We depend on technology every day. You're depending on technology right now watching this video. But do we depend on God every day? In Luke 9.23, the Bible says, And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. God wants us to deny ourselves and follow him every day. When we trust in the Lord as our Savior, it shouldn't stop there. God wants us to become more like Him and do the good works that He has prepared us for. We cannot grow spiritually without depending on Him for our every need. Jesus said in John 15 verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. We must abide in the Lord to bear fruit. He is the source of life and we must tap into the resources he provides to live for him and do his will. God wants us to trust in him, not our technology. If you are looking to technology or any other created thing to satisfy you, I have news for you, it's not going to satisfy you. Only God can truly bring you satisfaction. That is why we must depend and rely on Him. When we encounter bad circumstances, it is easy to become discouraged or even be brought to a point of despair. Especially if we are depending on things other than God. Look at Paul's response when he despaired of life itself. 2 Corinthians 1, 8-9 says, For do, we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength, that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. If we depend on something so heavily that when we are without it, it leads to despair, that is when we need to remember that God wants us to rely on Him and not ourselves or the things of this world. God wants us to use the bad circumstances and times of despair in our lives to make us rely on Him. We could certainly use technology and trust it to accomplish its purpose, but it is a problem if we are trusting it so much that we think it can bring satisfaction. We cannot trust in material things to bring lasting satisfaction. To think otherwise is believing a lie. 
Psalm 40 verse 4 says, Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. This verse makes it clear that to trust in anything other than the Lord is chasing a lie. The world might say that it is wise to trust in the insight and innovation of man, but that's not really where you find true wisdom and insight. These things are only found in the Lord. Proverbs 9 verse 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. It is fine to trust that technology will serve its purpose. But we need to be careful not to let it conform us to the world. Romans 12 verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The only way to truly serve God is to let His Word transform our minds. If we try to find our satisfaction in technology and let it fill our minds with the things of this world, then we are not depending on God like we should. We should depend on God more than our technology. So the next time you are frustrated with technology, let that remind you to trust in the Lord. Thanks for watching. Please be sure to share this video and follow us on social media. Let me know if this video occurs you in the comments below. Until next time, walk in the truth.